15 seconds. Minus 10 seconds. Niner, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, Okay, so what are we really talking about? Um, We're going to be talking about nuclear medicine, which is the application of nuclear technology, whether it is in the form of imaging or whether it is in the form of treatment to help people who have acquired brain injury, specific types, and the use of either nuclear medicine, radionucleotides, or uh, radioactive markers, or electromagnetic radiation. Um, And the way we image, or the way we treat. And these are two distinct um, applications. So let's get into it, first of all. Um, So there are a variety of different kinds of doctors, physicians that are involved in the use of nuclear medicine. Um, The most common and the oldest specialty, one of the oldest specialties, um, is radiology. Radiology relies on the use of penetrating electromagnetic radiation, X-rays, which were discovered by this guy, Wilhelm Röntgen, um, in the 1890s. This is a picture, an early picture that he made of his wife's hand. Um, This was an experiment by Röntgen. He was a physicist. um, And with this discovery, for the first time, we we could look inside the human body and did not have to cut it open. We did not have to do an autopsy to look inside. And it really changed the face of medicine. Um, it led to the birth of radiology and actually radiologic treatments for cancers because in the late 19th century, that quickly within those two years, there were doctors who were experimenting with the use of x-rays to treat tumors Um, because they had discovered rather quickly and so did Röntgen. He discovered that um, x-ray radiation could burn But they also discovered that exposure to radiation could cause skin tumors. And so they began almost immediately to use X-ray radiation to try to burn off skin tumors, uh, melanoma. And so almost immediately they started to use it this way. And the physicians of this time treated solid tumors inside the body, figuring, well, this kind of energy can get inside the body too. And so they began to treat breast cancer and uterine cancer, abdominal, colon things. Of course, they weren't as successful, but these early attempts were the birth of radiology and nuclear medicine. So, and scientific medicine had only begun in the 1860s, 1870s. So this is one of the first early specialties. It was also used in dentistry. Um, my dad had once mentioned to me, he knew a very elderly man when he was a a teenager who was a dentist and they had to make their own x-ray tubes, make their own x-ray tubes. Uh, and they had a color matching panel 
and it needed to be what they called apple green when they energized it um, to make sure that it was going to give the correct dose of X-ray radiation and not injure the patient or was strong enough to expose the film when they did dental X-rays. And this guy was in his 90s, so he was one of the earliest dentists that used X-rays. Quite interesting stuff. All right, so let's first of all talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. When we talk about electromagnetic radiation, what we really are talking about is light. Photons, which are particles of light, they're both wave-like and particle light. We don't have to get into that, but they have properties of both, depending on how you look at it. Um, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet light, visible light, infrared. You've seen that if you have seen infrared pictures, you have a heat-based sensor or something, a light out in the back of your, your yard to detect, you know, like movement. Or radio waves. They are all light. It's just that visible light is the portion that your eyes can see. Here's, a, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. But all of them are light. They all behave the same in that they follow the same principles of light, which were defined fairly early by um, Isaac Newton. And now, different materials are needed to bend or to refract light, uh, depending on how penetrating it is. But light is still light. And it is important to understand that um, light, any kind of light, whether it's gamma rays or x-rays, or whether it is radio waves, electromagnetic radiation, as it's called, is produced by the movement of electrons. They produce photons of any sort of light throughout the electromagnetic spectrum, whether it is low energy with long wavelengths, like radio waves, or ultra short, down to smaller than cells, smaller than even the nucleus of an atom. We're talking about gamma rays at that end. What's important to understand is light does not, of the what we call ionizing radiation, and the reason we call it that is because it's, it's so energetic, it strips the electrons off of atoms. And that's what makes it dangerous. If uh, high energy ionizing radiation, which applies to ultraviolet x-rays and gamma rays, the reason it causes the damage it does to your cells is because the wavelength is very short, it's very energetic, and it'll strip out the electrons. And ionized atoms form bonds with other atoms, ionic bonds, and they can be destructive to DNA. Radio waves and microwaves are way too long to do that. Think about it. If radio waves are longer than visible light, then why doesn't visible light do damage? The damage mainly that could be caused by radio waves and microwaves is heating. Heating can lead to burns, pretty serious ones too. I'm an amateur radio operator. I have my extra class license, which is a top license. I've gotten burned using that equipment. That's the risk. RF energy can burn you if you're too close to it. But the radio waves are way longer, way bigger than cells or even your body. So any of the stuff about Wi-Fi or about 5G or whatever else, those waves are way too long to cause cellular damage. They do not form ions inside your body. They don't. The waves are too big. Ionizing radiation is ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays because they are small enough to fit within the circumference of an atom. This is what makes them ionizing. All right, so in order to understand radiation, we need to understand the atom, at least some basics. All right, so an atom is made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, the simplest atom, hydrogen, at its basic, is really just a proton with an electron in orbit around it. 
It's the one atom that does not have neutrons, but this is not the norm. Um, everything beyond simple, stable hydrogen. And the goal of all atoms is to be stable. Chemical reactions are caused by mostly bonding on the electron level. What distinguishes one type of atom, what makes silicon, silicon, lead, lead, carbon, carbon, is the number of protons in the nucleus. They interact on the electron level. We're not going to get deeper than that, but I will just say it's the number of protons. Now, in an atom, um, there are also neutrons. Protons carry a positive charge. Electrons carry a negative charge, usually, usually. We'll get to that one as, as we go a little deeper. Neutrons carry no electrical charge. But electrons, protons, and neutral, neutrons, bleh, neutrons have mass. They, they're stuff. They have weight. I um, don't like using weight, but because it's not exactly the right term, but for our intents and purposes here, they have weight. But neutrons do not have charge, and charge is important. Okay? So they weigh, but they have no electrical charge. Okay? The thing is, atoms that are stable, the same number of protons, same number of neutrons. This is what your, your, if you look here on the periodic table, here's an element. Um, you'll notice that here on the one side is just a number. This is uranium. You notice over here is what's called the atomic number. That is the number of protons. Over here, 238 is the atomic mass. That is the weight of uranium. The number is how many protons are in it. The atomic mass is the weight of the atom. It's important to keep in mind, and that's protons and neutrons, that sometimes you can have different numbers of neutrons from the number of protons. Chemically, its reactions are pretty much the same regardless of the number of neutrons because its weight will vary, but its chemical reactivity is the same. So separating the different kinds of uranium, which the different kinds are called isotopes, the different numbers of neutrons make for different isotopes. So you can have different variants of uranium, which chemically will react in the same way, but because of their different masses, uranium-235 and uranium-238 will chemically interact mostly in the same way, but their masses are different because they're different numbers of neutrons, but the same number of protons. This is uranium-235. This is uranium-238. Same number of protons, which means same number of electrons, different number of neutrons. Now, why is this important? This matters because they, uh, uranium-235 will do something called fission. It means it, it doesn't like being unstable between the number of protons and neutrons. So the forces that bind it together are weaker. There's a binding force that has to hold this all together. And we call this the weak force, weak nuclear force. But there are different ways that isotopes disintegrate or break apart, fission. Um, if there's, first of all, natural decay. In uranium-238, which is the most common of the, of the uranium and transuranic elements, which we refer to as nuclear, 
because we use them to produce energy or to treat. These elements, we that they spontaneously will break apart. If you take uh, a large a ton of uranium-238, which is the natural uranium out of the ground, 0.7% of that is uranium-235. And it will spontaneously decay. If you look through that 0.7%, that uranium will break apart naturally. And it forms two different atoms because they have fewer protons and neutrons when it splits here. Here's a picture of uranium-238, or uranium-235, I apologize, 235, fissioning. And here is, this is, when it breaks apart, it releases neutrons. And those neutrons that are spit out will hit other atoms. And they will hit other atoms causing them to fission. And that's what we're looking for when we build a nuclear reactor and do it artificially. We are trying to increase the number of neutrons to help facilitate dividing of atoms. And we look for these already unstable atoms, these isotopes, to sustain fission reaction. This is called a chain reaction. Here is... Uh, cute little uh, demonstration of how fission works in a reactor of a chain reaction. A neutron, represented by the ping pong ball, triggers off other atoms to divide, release theirs and theirs and theirs and theirs and theirs. And this is what our goal is. The thing is, what is left afterward is different elements isotopes. And th there are different ways for elements to decay. Um, one of the ways in which they decay, these unstable elements to decay, is what's called by releasing an alpha particle, which is helium, to protons, to neutrons. So it can spit out a helium nucleus. We call this an alpha emission. Or you can get a proton emission where just a proton is spit out um, to make itself more stable. You can get a double proton emission where two protons are spit out. You can get a neutron emission where it just tosses out one or two neutrons. Um, 
In some cases, you can get what's called an electron capture. And this is where a nucleus will, one of its electrons literally is captured by the nucleus, center of the atom, and it will force it to emit a what's called a neutrino. And the daughter's left, the daughter nucleus, what is resulting from this, will be left excitable and likely deficient. Neutrino is a neutral particle that has almost no mass. And so it can pass through dense, heavy objects. It can pass through a light year of lead without interacting. It's that unlikely to interact. Finally, um, there's a positron emission. Remember how I said electrons are almost always negative in charge and protons are almost always positive. Well, in a very rare cases, um, a nuclear proton can be converted to a neutron by emitting a positron, which is a positively charged electron. Um, and it'll spit out an electron neutrino, which is a special type of neutrino. We don't have to get into that. Um, but so these are the different modes of decay. Um, there are many others, but again, this is, we're not teaching nuclear physics here. So how does all of this apply? Well, when it comes to imaging, as I said, X-rays are high energy light. And in order to produce X-rays, if you have, well, Here's an X-ray machine in the interior. To image, one of the earliest ways we did that was by X-raying the, you know, doing a planar X-ray where you just literally directly shoot an X-ray beam through the head, or, you know, through the side, whatever, to get an image like this. Pneumoencephalography was another way, um, like this. And where you would literally draw six milliliters of fluid, cerebrospinal fluid out of the back, and you would use a chair to reposition the patient and use that to see if there was a, a space occupying lesion, tumor, or you'd look to see if there was blood. Very painful procedure because taking cerebrospinal fluid out like this causes shifts in the brain's position. So hurt. But this is what we did before we had another X-ray based imaging device, CT scanner, which also uses X-ray photons. Um, and it spins the X-ray gun around your head and it moves you through this tunnel to obtain a spiral based image. And then the computer reconstructs what it receives on the other side. Um, to put together a three-dimensional image so that you can observe slices depending on the anatomical plane you're looking at. Um, so that's the CT scanner, which is nothing but a spinning X-ray gun or several of them at a much lower energy level to reduce the amount of X radiation you're exposed to because it is ionizing radiation, but at a much, much lower level. Um, so that is CT scanning. There's also something called a PET scan. Now, what is this? Um, with a PET scan, what you do is you use a device like this, which is called a cyclotron. Cyclotron uses, um, a stream of neutrons, which it smashes into elements to convert them into isotopes of a more stable atom. And over time, then those unstable atoms will decay and they give off in the process. They will give off. Remember how I said about the positrons, they will give off positively charged electrons, which do something called annihilate. So a positively charged electron hits a negatively charged electron, and they spit out um, gamma rays, 
of a very specific type of 511 kiloelectron volts. That has to do with how much energy these gamma rays in uh, random directions, usually in 180 degrees of each other, but random directions too. Um, again, we're not getting into that, but basically they have a specific charge, which is important, exactly 511 kiloelectron volts. So we know what we're looking for. And what you do is you take the atoms that you've made radioactive by hitting them with a neutron to so make them into an isotope. Um, and then you will couple them with uh, glucose, for example. You may take out a certain element from sugar or from a what's called a radio ligand, which is something that will bond. Um, and you will chemically attach this radioactive it, it acts like a like a blinking light in effect not literally but you know on the, in the radioactive portion of the spectrum and then you will inject it into the patient something else you can use is a radioactive variant of oxygen called oxygen 15 this is why you need the cyclotron also these are very expensive by the way like really expensive the cyclotrons and you, it decays away very quickly. Oxygen 15 becomes just regular oxygen or its byproducts in a minute or two. So you can't purchase this from a special pharmacy. And that's who makes these typically. But if you need to use this special type of oxygen, you've got to make it yourself. So this only is found in really high and in hospitals with a lot of money. All right. So anyway, you make this special type of oxygen or this special type of glucose, which that only lasts for like 12 hours. So you have to get it flown or brought or you make it yourself. Um, again, a hospital with a lot of money um, for making it yourself. If you have a nuclear pharmacy um, and you do the bonding and then you inject it or have the patient breathe and you, you give them mental tasks to do. Or you just watch how their brain metabolizes, how it uses the sugar or how it uses the oxygen. And you watch what's going on inside their brain. And it will show you their function, how well their brain is functioning. Are certain areas of the brain more or less active than they should be um, over time with doing this? Now, eventually, these products decay away and become the normal variant again, become the non non-gamma uh, ray emitting variants. Remember how I said these positron producing uh, nuclear pharmaceuticals decay back to what they were and pretty quickly, which is why like with the radioactive oxygen, you've got to make it continuously because it's gone in a minute and the sugar has gone pretty darn quickly too. And for the sugar, you, just, you excrete uh, the remnants in your urine. Um, so PET relies then on the receiver, which is the device you put the patient into, it has a series of what are called scintillation crystals. And a scintillation crystal detects the gamma ray photons at 511 kiloelectron volts. Because remember how I said that these, these elements that give off the positrons, that when they break down their specific elements, and so they will emit at 500 kiloelectron volts. And so the crystals are tuned, the scintillation crystals, to pick up photons of that wavelength and energy. So they know that what they're seeing is from materials that are radioactive at that energy level that are going to give off photons at that energy level. And so um, the detectors have to be made of specific materials that have a high light yield, which is how bright they'll glow when they detect these incoming gamma ray photons. They have to only, you know, be only light up briefly because if they stay lit up too long from exposure to gamma ray photons and they stay lit, then you don't pick up other photons. So they got to flash fast and they need to be made fairly dense. So they pick up, so they pick up the photons at a quick rate. Um, so there's certain characteristics, light yield, 
density and resolution, which is that they, they flash much faster. And only certain crystals behave this way. And then you have a photomultiplier device, which picks up a weak signal. And you arrange them all around the patient. And that's how you're able to resolve activity in the brain. And this is used to look for patients with dementia, changes in their brain over time. This is used to look for patients with traumatic brain injury, strokes. Um, but it's limited where you can use it because you either A, have to make these radiopharmaceuticals yourself, or you have to buy it from a nuclear pharmacy that can make these things and get them to you fast because they decay quickly. Now, there's a brother, you might say, or sister to this procedure known as SPECT, single photon emission computed tomography. Just like PET, which is positron emission tomography, um, it also relies on products from a nuclear pharmacy. The difference is that you are more limited in what you can see with it. You can only see blood flow because they rely on a much more stable set of isotopes that are produced here in a medical nuclear reactor, which is a special type of nuclear reactor made to produce longer living isotopes. And in those cases, what they'll do is they'll give you, you know, like a um, nuclear generator. Now, what this is, is a device that uses a long-lived isotope like rubidium or something like that to irradiate a shorter-lived isotope that you could have on site and make more cheaply. So you'll buy the radioactive generator from the company, from the nuclear pharmacy, this kind of gizmo, and you'll use this to make for individual patients like technetium or something like that, radioactive for observation of blood flow or metabolism for a less specific view. It'll show you oxygen use or sugar use, uh, but it's not as clear. The resolution is lower for SPECT. So it really doesn't tell you anything more than which areas are active or not active. SPECT is not as specific as using a PET scanner. It can't tell you specifically which areas it can't tell you because it's just a, it's a gamma camera. It uses scintillation detectors, but it's less clear. And it, it is not prognostic, and it's not as great for diagnosis. But it is okay when you don't have the resources to have a cyclotron on site, and you don't have the, if you don't have the training either to handle a PET scanner. You usually need a medical physicist who is an expert in making the computations and things like that. You also need a nuclear medicine physician who's trained in reading and interpreting these things. For SPECT, um, you can use somebody who has training as a neurologist or you know just a general physician can learn how to read those. But unfortunately, for longevity and cost, you trade some of the accuracy. SPECT's okay. PET is better for making specific diagnoses. Um, that's, but it at least points you in the right way for your next steps for then going for there, but it can help. So spec definitely has its place. Um, it is improving. There is new technology to help with the application of AI and computers to help improve the accuracy. It has a lot of the same, like as far as detection is concerned, the gamma cameras use the scintillation detectors, which rely on light yield, which rely on resolution and density of the crystals. And, you know, so those are still the same concerns. All right. Now, what about treatment? There are different ways and different applications to treat. Um, if you're going to um, be treating, you would want to use either what was commonly called the gamma knife. It's got a bunch of different names or cyber knife. Now the gamma knife is basically a large chunk of cobalt 60 uh, encased in a shield to keep the uh, gamma rays contained with a bunch of collimator holes. Uh, these are used to focus the beams and direct the beams of gamma radiation to concentrate them on, say, a tumor or an arteriovenous malformation, a tangle of malformed blood vessels, to literally burn it 
The advantage, of course, being that each beam in itself is, is much less damaging, except for where it hits. And then you would wear a helmet. Looks almost like a colander or <laughs> something along those lines. Here's one. And you're, you can be fit inside. Now, the new ones don't even need you to wear anything anymore. The computers can assist in targeting. Um, but there's always some side effects of swelling, things like that. Um, but they use these beams of gamma rays that are emitted by the decay of the nucleus of the cobalt atom. When it becomes unstable, breaks apart, spits out neutrons, and triggers other cobalt atoms to break apart, there's the emission of gamma rays. Um, and those gamma rays then are reflected around inside the machine and then are directed through the holes and target different areas on a person's brain where they're concentrated. They are, they are not as tissue destructive until they finally hit the target. And that's where computers come in to make sure that the beams hit as they should. Now, there's another device. There's the CyberKnife, which uses a series of X-ray generators, of so basically X-ray beams on robot arms. And these can be positioned automatically around the patient's head. And it will shoot these X-ray beams of low intensity until they are concentrated right on the tumor or the arteriovenous malformation or the area that has, if you have seizures and have a seizure focus, can be destroyed without cutting the skin. And again, it relies on targeting, um, a computer-based targeting, XYZ system. Some patients wear over their head secured to them um, a stereotactic surgical frame. And basically all that is is metal pieces that have to be, you know, s secured to your head. Um, so that's how that works. Um, but it's good for treating tumors, uh, for treating arteriovenous venous malformations, or even like swelling. If you have an, the beginnings of an aneurysm, it can be used to target those weak walls and blood vessels and seal them off. Um, patients with neuralgia, and if they have an overexcitable area either in their brain or overexcitable nerves, can be used to burn that. Um, it is the reason it's called stereotactic radio surgery. But again, you need the same doctors. You need a uh, you need a nuclear physicist uh, who can calculate the doses and targeting and those kind of things. And then you also usually have a nuclear medicine doctor. It can be used to target tumors in the spine, in the abdomen, chest, also. But our main focus is. I'm talking about this here is hmm. also in some cases, this is not as common anymore, but they still do it. They'll plant what they call radioactive seeds, which are small pieces of encapsulated radioactive material into the brain itself, right on or around the tumor site, a very low level, but they emit gamma radiation to destroy tumors. And this is kind of like a last, ditch desperate attempt. If surgery hasn't been successful in resecting it, immunotherapy, chemo, and they don't know what else to do. Um, this is something else. There are, um, they use electron beams, high energy electron beams, um, which is exactly what it sounds like. They will accelerate beams of of electrons at nearly the speed of light, which gives them extra mass to destroy tumors and aberrant blood vessels and seizure sites. They will do the same with proton beam therapy, which is what you think it is. It is using protons that are produced either through nuclear decay process or that are generated through a special type of linear accelerator. This thing again. Um, and they are literally targeted because each atom is mostly empty space it can pass pretty well through your body to hit the target but inevitably there will be some tissue damage and edema but it is an effective way of treating tumors um there was experiments with using anti-protons back in the 80s um but 
building a cyclotron that makes antiprotons or positrons is hard. Storing them is virtually impossible. You use a device called a penning trap to hold them, which is magnetic. Um, but they still manage to tunnel through sometimes and annihilate in places you don't want them to annihilate. But who knows what the future holds? There have been attempts to use beta radiation and things along those lines. So that's just basically a quick overview of nuclear medicine and its applications in treating brain injury. There are side effects, swelling, edema, um, injuring tissue you don't want to, and the increased risk of cancer because it is ionizing radiation that we're using. Um, there have been attempts with RF energy. Um, it's kind of limited because although it's penetrating, it isn't strong enough necessarily to burn out um, tumors in an effective way, um, but it definitely has potential applications. It'll be interesting to see what comes along next, but Hopefully you found this helpful and interesting. Um, if you have any questions, please below. And uh, any uh, any any other comments, please. Thank you, and see you see you later. Bye.